Hi, this is Joe Hyde with Sandra Live, and uh, I have August Fluger. We got him on a on a video call here, uh, live from Capitol Hill. And August, uh, he is our, our 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 congressman for Congressional District 11. Today was the inauguration of a new president, President Joe Biden, Joe Biden, and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. And were you at the ceremony? Yeah, Joe. Thanks for having me. I was at the ceremony. You know, it's important. Um, to be there. And I, I may disagree with the policies, but I respect the office of the president. There's a lot of security in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the reports we have, 25,000 National Guard troops, maybe some active duty there. Um, what, what is it like? I mean, is there anyone even there other than congressmen and their staffs? No, it's an unfortunate sight. You know, this is not the America that we, that we know and love and, and you know, Obviously, the events that happened on the 6th of January, I totally condemn the violence, have done so throughout the summer in cities like Portland, Chicago, Kenosha, Seattle, um, and strongly condemn the violence that happened at the Capitol on the 6th. And, you know, this is a reaction, but I think part of it was, uh, was a partisan showing um, to bring in that many troops. I mean, we forget that in 2017, the inauguration of Donald Trump, we, we, we forget hundreds of violent protests in Washington, D.C. Um, with, you know, the burning of, of businesses and, and injuries uh, of officers, of law enforcement. And so, um, you know, it's disappointing to see uh, the amount of militarization uh, to the ceremony today. We're both officers in the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, or retired. Or I'm retired. I guess you're still reservist. Um, right. My thoughts, I mean, they were vetting these troops and saying, finding out if they were involved in some kind of unregulated militia or something like that. I mean, I mean, to me, the thought of, of, of doing that outside the command structure of the military was very bad for the Esprit de Corps. What do you think? Well, Representative Cohen uh, came out and suggested that because people had voted for Trump or fit a, a profile um, that could vote for Trump, that they would somehow not be up for the task to protect and defend the Constitution that they had sworn an oath to, uh, and to be to be fit for duty um, to protect the inaugural event, which is just absolutely the most disrespectful and disgraceful thing that I've heard. Uh, there's absolutely no place uh, for that. that. That reminds you of a Gestapo-like force um, that is being instilled, where if you have a viewpoint um, and, and you're entitled to your own uh, First Amendment rights, um, but yet you're serving in the military, then they can, you know, deprive you of service because you have a viewpoint that doesn't match with the current party in power. And that's just despicable. Well, I think that the bigger problem is they're asking fellow comrades in arms, you know, in your unit. Can you imagine guys in your squadron turning you in behind your back uh, for things yeah. you didn't, you know? I mean, there's obviously if, if people are saying in any sort of fashion or, or advocating for violence or advocating for um, you know, anything that goes beyond our First Amendment rights, where well, there's no place for that. But you're right. Um, to have people turn on each other in a way uh, that, that's not uh, in accordance with the Constitution, is, uh, there's no absolutely no room for that either. All right. So let's go back to January 6th. We haven't talked to you since then. What was that like? You're were, you were on the floor. You, the, the House and the Senate had split, uh, split up to go debate, uh, I guess, the vote in Arizona, the electors of Arizona. Uh, how did you find out that the Capitol had been breached and, you know, just kind of run us through that day? Well, yeah, it was, again, a tragic day and, and one that, uh, you know, we will remember and, and not for the good merits, uh, for, for the bad and, and absolutely no room for violence or, um, you know, our right to peaceably assemble was taken a step too far. And it was a, a very small few people of the thousands of people who were here to have their voices be heard. Um, you know, for me personally, um, was not on the floor at the time that the, the chamber was, was breached, um, and, and we had been alerted to the fact that there was uh, a security threat. There had been security threats throughout the morning, um, whether it was a bomb threat uh, just outside of the Capitol or otherwise. And so, uh, you know, just a completely um, sad day to know that, that those people would take it a step too far. Uh, again, no room for that, especially when we're debating and having a transparent uh, discussion on the merits uh, of the election system and, 
you know, just one, one of the things that goes against our American ideals. Well, when you were, let's go, go back to this. Good that, that you didn't, you didn't have a safety concern, but let's go back to the decision to object to the, uh, the electors. Some, some have criticized you in the district that you went against the constitution in doing that. And you were part of the, I guess, the desire to overthrow our government by objecting to those electors. Now, on the other hand, you have more conservative constitutionalist uh, commentators like Mark Levin, who's an attorney, says, no, they were actually absolutely, they were absolutely performing their constitutional duty because it's outlined in the constitution that the House, is, House and Senate are to, do, to uh, confirm the electors. Can you just, in your own words, kind of explain your decision uh, making process and also, the other interesting thing about it was that even after the breach, you're, you're arguing in Arizona, and then they had the breach, and you came back and you, you objected to Pennsylvania, too. Can you just go through your decision-making process there? Well, this was a very tough decision. Constitutionally, the 14th Amendment and Article 2 um, are at odds here. And, you know, I, I've heard all sorts of opinions on this from very smart people, constitutional uh, authorities. You know, I, the entire time leading up to that, I, I called for a transparent debate. That was the point of what we were doing, was to debate the merits um, of whether or not, in my opinion, um, the, the case that, uh, that really had, you know, the most teeth to it was whether or not state legislators, state legislatures um, in a couple of the states had been circumvented. And whether it was a secretary of state or an election judge, or even in some cases, the governor of a state had made executive decisions and circumvented the state legislature, which Article 2 clearly outlines, is responsible for the undertaking um, in, in the operation of elections. And so that's what we were looking to, uh, to debate and, and have a transparent discussion on. Uh, and again, this was very tough. Um, those that suggest that I'm trying to do anything uh, other than have that debate uh, have, have lost sight of the bigger picture here. And especially when you go back to 2005 and you hear Speaker Pelosi on the floor objecting to the election results and 80 Democrats who also did the same and walked out on the vote. This is, this we only have to look at recent recent history. Go back to 2005. 2005 was the election of George W. Bush. He was reelected in 2004 in the election. And then you're saying Pelosi objected uh, on the floor to that. So a couple of floor speeches on January 6th um, used her own words while she was at the podium as Speaker of the House. They used her speech and read it back to her as their own speech to also object to, to the different you know, aspects of Article 2 that we think um, could have been um, circumvented. And so, you know, in, in spite of that, Joe, the, the real work right now comes from the states and the local levels doing the hard work. Uh, I am a co-sponsor of the Save Democracy Act, um, which seeks to help basically establish a foundation of fair, transparent uh, election systems while allowing the states and preserving the electoral college. So whether it's the casting of ballots or the tabulation of ballots, making sure that we can have a national database or that social security numbers are checked uh, or that signatures are verified or that mail out ballots are not sent to people who don't ask for them. Those are the kind of things that this, um, this legislation would seek to improve uh, and, and really create a strong foundation from which to launch from. So what you're telling me is, is your objection to the, the two, uh, two states electors was that we never really had an evidentiary hearing on, on the allegations of voter fraud or irregularities. That's and, right. In, in Pennsylvania specifically, the legislatures were, were circumvented. In Arizona, litigation was still ongoing. And so in, in both of those cases, slightly different in each of them, um, but the process one could argue, and I argued, was not according to Article 2. Again, this was a very tough vote. I mean, this was an extremely tough um, discussion to have. Uh, there were opposing viewpoints in the, in the Republican Party on, on both sides of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it came down uh, to wanting to have the gold standard for our election system. And moving forward, that's really where the hard work has to be done. The, um, the allegation from the left would be that Congress congressmen and senators to object to Ted Cruz. Uh, they're going after Josh Hawley, uh, the two senators, and of course, all the Republican uh, 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 congressmen who objected. 
they were saying that you were setting forth false hope in the minds of, of people outside. And that's why that's one of the contributing factors to the rioting at the Capitol. Was it your, your wasn't your intention to have uh, Vice President uh, Pence uh, object or somehow throw this back to the states? Like there was, you know, there was a lot of opinion out there that that could happen, or it was not your intention to overturn the election. Is that well? Reasonable? That's a ludicrous idea, and um, our our intention the entire time was to have a transparent debate and a discussion on the merits of how the election was um, was was exercised in various states. But you didn't think that after this you would come out with uh, President Trump being the being president and getting a second term? No, I think the the goal here as and again as we move forward is to make sure that we never get to this place again that we have 70 plus million people um you know who don't question the results that we move forward i mean we sent a man to the moon 50 plus years ago so not being able to accurately and and quickly efficiently get to the conclusion is is really why we're here right okay let's go into this now there there's a couple of new house rules uh that the democrats have put imposed on you and one of them is the inability to for the minority party to issue a, a motion to recommit so i looked down all the work you've done so far uh, co-sponsoring the save democracy act of course which is uh for voting the balanced budget amendment good luck with that uh you know keep the nine amendment protecting life and crisis act the abortion program i mean all of these things are you know, obviously conservative legislation. How in the heck are you going to get anywhere with it? What is the well, plan? Well, and Joe, it's, it's important to note that I'm, I'm also the first freshman uh, to introduce legislation on either side of the aisle. Um, mm -hmm. And I introduced a piece of legislation uh, that commits to protecting the oil and gas industry and making sure that the incoming administration, which is now uh, President Biden, doesn't issue a moratorium on drilling on federal lands, which we know that they are seeking to, to kill that industry, which would result in the death of 2 million jobs in Texas. And so um, I was the first freshman to put that forward. And so to your question, the motion to recommit is a very important parliamentary procedure for the minority party to have a voice on the floor when it comes to legislation. Well, what they've done is they've basically reduced the effectiveness of it and they've killed the ability to even have a discussion or to object when it comes to legislation that is introduced by the majority party. And so this is a very dangerous precedent. It, it reverses over a hundred years um, of order in the house where you have the ability, regardless of the party that you're in, you have the ability for your voice to be heard. And that's what we're talking about. The reason that we have such a divisive um, tone and, and impassioned uh, arguments in our country right now is because people don't feel like their voices are being heard, whether it's the media that's censoring uh, the content on Facebook or Twitter or removing people like they've done to President Trump uh, or any other, you know, liberal media outlets that just, you know, they, they feed you what they want. And, and I think a lot of media outlets can be blamed for this. But the point is that people's voices they feel are not being heard. The same can be said right now in the 117th Congress where Speaker Pelosi has introduced this, you know, very, very reduced and washed out motion to recommit so that now the Republican Party hardly has a voice when it comes to legislation that's introduced by the other side. So how, how are we going to fight this? If you're a Republican, you support Republicans, how do you fight this? Well, this is one of the interesting things about Congress. The rules are set by the Speaker. The Speaker right. controls right. everything from the security. They now have metal detectors entering the chamber floor where members of Congress have to get wanded to make sure that we are, we are safe. I mean, th this is... This is how far to the left they have gone. And, and by introducing you know, this reduced effectiveness for the motion to recommit, it, it provides very little chance um, to fight back in a meaningful way once a bill gets to the floor. Right. Well, Congressman Fluger, you got your work turn, uh, cut out for you. And, uh, and, I, and I appreciate you giving our, our uh, readers and people here in CD11 uh, take on what you're doing what is in just in closing what is the next thing on the, on the agenda for you know well you know uh, we started out by talking about the inauguration today and then i went because i wanted to hear what president biden had to say you know and he talked about a couple of things that struck me uh as odd you know one of them was unity 
Um, and when we talk about unity, you know, the, the, the actions need to match what the words are saying. And so his words were fine, uh, but now the actions uh, we'll see. I mean, you know, he's in the process of signing sweeping uh, executive orders, which I think would, would basically undo the last four years on a number of issues. He has not come out um, to say that the impeachment was rushed, that there was no due process. I mean, these are the kind of things when we talk about unity, you would expect that, that if he really is for unity, that he would say. He also denounced uh, domestic terrorism, but I don't remember throughout the summer any denouncement of violence or, or rioting in any of the cities like Portland or Seattle or Chicago or New York or Kenosha. And so, you know, I have to question the intent behind, again, what seems like very nice words, but the actions aren't matching up. And not to mention the fact that the very first action he is going to take is to kill the Keystone Pipeline, which is energy independence and security and national security. And it affects our district specifically because we in the Permian Basin produce 40% of the country's oil. And you know, you, you look at these things. And so I have to question, yeah, we, we do need healing. I have called for healing. I have denounced and condemned the violence and we need to take a deep breath. Uh, but on the other hand, what we actually see happening through the actions right now is a more inflammatory tone, um, and it's this insidious step towards more divisiveness. Um, you know, to to wake up tomorrow to socialism. You said you're going to wake up tomorrow to socialism. I mean, that's right. what it appears that we are going to wake up tomorrow to socialism, and it's it's those who are calling for unity and, and calling uh, for more peace that are actually dividing uh, through through bad policy uh, the country. Well, good luck to you up there. Don't get arrested. <laughs> um, Joe, that's not a question. So, <laughs> and, uh, and we will talk to you probably in about two weeks. We'll kind of keep these things, these, this dialogue going. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. And God bless our district, the hardworking people, honest people. I'm so lucky and, and humbled to serve the, the best district in the country. So I appreciate you having me on.